Hello and welcome back to the third row. In this week's video I am pursuing my quest for a few millimeters. If you haven't already, I'd recommend you watch the previous video on the topic, where I cover some aspects that might help in understanding this video a bit better. I've put a little link at the top right hand corner of your screen now if you fancy catching up. But here's a quick recap in any case. In the Merklin Amtrak system, there are two crossings designed to be used with radius 2 turnouts to create parallel track combinations. The crossings are symmetrical, with both straights measuring a standard straight length of 180 mm. This length wouldn't be enough to join the diagonals with a turnout on a parallel track, so a makeup bit was designed for this purpose. The crossings were sold with a pair of D's. With this arrangement, the standard parallel spacing for radius 2 and the vertical alignment of standard straight parallel sections is maintained. This does not work as it should in track planning software. I looked at four packages and the standard parallel spacing is off by more or less the same value in all of them. After a bit of maths, I had made the assumption that the crossings were not configured properly in any of them, and I thought this could be fixed easily. Some developers have come back to me in the meantime, and it looks like I was correct and wrong at the same time. Something is definitely wrong, and it's by design. You could also say that it is a story of a compromise that led to a lucky accident, which in turn became a compromise. Let me explain. In my interactions with some of the developers, it appeared that there is some confusion about the dimensions of the track, so we'll start by looking into this again for their benefit. As mentioned in the previous video, Merklin wasn't clear about the dimensions of the crossings in their catalogues, but more precise dimensions were published in the Merklin track plan books, and these are the measurements that should be used for our purpose. Don't believe me? Let's measure and compare the real thing with the track plan books. Let's start with the turnout curve. Merklin states an angle of 24 degrees 17 minutes for a radius of 437.4 millimeters, and that's in both catalogues and track plan books. I can't measure the angle with what I have, but I can check the chord of such a curve. The maths tell us that it should be 184 millimeters long. So here's a 5202 turnout. I'll measure the distance between the center of both ends of the curves, and the tape measurer shows 184 millimeters. That's spot on. Now let's look at the crossing curve. Merklin states an angle of 23 degrees 16 minutes for a radius of 437.4 millimeters in the track plan books, and that is 1 degree 1 minute less than in the catalogues. The maths tell us the chord length should be 176.4 millimeters. Here's a real 5207 crossing and the tape measurer shows a measurement of just over 176 millimeters, which is close enough. So the angles of the turnout and crossing are indeed different, but the curvature is identical. The 5208 maker bit is straight and should measure 8 millimeters according to the catalogues and track plan books. I have two here that came with the crossing we just measured, and they both measure 7.7mm. If you push the caliper a bit harder, you even get to 7.6mm. So Merklin rounded the figure up here. If we add a 5208 bit to a crossing curve and measure the extended curve, we get to a chord length of 184 and maybe 0.1 of a millimeter. So the measurements are close enough. For the doubters, my dimensions are therefore correct and not something I just came up with for convenience. I think this should settle this point now. 
Now let's have a closer look at the geometry. In my last video I focused on comparing lengths, but a piece of track has other dimensions, which I completely ignored. And this is a facepalm moment for me, because one, this is so obvious, and two, I now remember I had discussed this very point at length with the developer of Rare Modeler Pro a few years back already. What we are doing here is placing the side of a straight piece of track, so the side of a rectangle, against the end of a curved section of track, which is itself a straight line. So, of course, the sides of the rectangle will inherit the angle of the line it has been placed against. It's basic geometry, primary school level. I did say in the last video that I could potentially make a fool of myself with my maths. I wasn't wrong, was I? So, looking at this from a strict mathematical perspective, this track system combination should not achieve the desired result. We might extend the length as required, but we are still missing one degree, one minute. And this matters. A lot. Indeed, if you assemble tracks together as tight as you can, you do not get parallel tracks. So why is this working? The answer lies in the way the track pieces are attached to each other, of course. There is always a small gap between tracks and the fish plates have a certain amount of flexibility. This allows track sections to shift ever so slightly and as a result, the parallelism occurs naturally once a combination is fully laid. Now, let's have a look at the software. And first of all, I'd like to thank all developers for the time they took to answer my queries. This is much appreciated and has helped a lot. This type of issue is also a bit more involved to answer compared to a simple do this to achieve that type of query. So thanks for the patience here. All developers have confirmed the crossings have indeed the wrong dimensions, whatever the package. Why is that so? I was given two explanations. The first one was that the figure was simply taken from the catalogues, which would be wrong as we've seen earlier. The second one is that a compromise was made. The use of the wrong figure leads to a lucky accident. Why lucky accident? Well, if you take two standard straight sections and make them cross at a 24 degrees 70 minute angle, a couple of things happen. First of all, as it is the same angle as the turnout curve, it compensates for it and produces a parallel track. Super! Secondly, if you add the 8mm bit, everything seems to line up vertically as well, just as the Merklin geometry states it should. Isn't that great? It is understandable under these circumstances that anyone not familiar with the Amtrak system might think everything is in order and would release the library as is. But all is not as good as it seems. If we look a bit closer, we'll notice a couple of things. The tracks are in fact not aligned vertically, there is a difference of 0.8 millimeters, and the parallel spacing is also wrong, which is the reason for this video. This fact might go unnoticed by the end user due to software tolerances and the small size of the error, but it will end up generating support queries from nitpickers like me at some point. When fielding such a query, the developer will start by double-checking his data source, in this case the catalogue, do a comparison with the dimensions used in the software, and come to the conclusion that it is mathematically impossible to achieve the desired parallel spacing. The Merklin geometry must simply be wrong, and this is the answer he would give to the user, and indeed, I found myself at the receiving end of such answers in the past. If he decides to investigate this a bit more, he will soon find out what the actual dimensions are and try changing them in the software. And of course, this will reveal the Merklin compromise in all its glory. CAD software is supposed to be exact. It will align the track sections in a mathematically correct fashion and the parallelism will be lost.
Replicating the flexibility of the track system would be trying to achieve the opposite of what the software was designed to do. So there is no easy solution here. You could use large tolerances with correctly sized crossings, which would make the software think tracks are joined, but this solution is messy and would require users to lay their track in a certain sequence to achieve the desired result without generating other alignment issues in the process. Or you could try and program something, but this would mean introducing an exception that could be difficult to maintain in the long run, and potentially could cause trouble with other software components or library. We have to remember that most companies making these products are very small, so resources are limited in terms of development and support. An easy fix mentioned by David of AnyRail would be to change the 5208 to a curve. But this could confuse people and it would remove the ability to use this track section in straight combinations. So this is where the lucky accident becomes a compromise. The current version sort of works if you don't look too close and there aren't many calls about it. Adopting the exact dimensions could break things. There is no mathematical or easy programmatic way to emulate the behavior of the track system. You would need to change the 5208 to a curve to get the crossing geometry to work, but you would lose the use of the piece in straights. It is therefore easier to leave things as they are, even if this introduces inconsistencies in the radius to geometry. And this is the position adopted by all developers of the commercial products I spoke about. But how is Xtrack CAD, an open source alternative, handling this? I mentioned in the last video that the geometry there was much closer, so I had another look at what they did. By measuring a bit better, we in fact have a situation similar to the one in the commercial products, but the difference was made less perceivable by tweaking the angle used for all radius to turnouts and crossings. In the end, this is wrong too, and probably more so because almost every radius to element was touched. So there we are. We know what is happening now, and the manual workaround I suggested at the end of the previous video should be a way to rectify this little issue manually for those who care about such tiny little things. The idea of a curved 5208 mentioned earlier intrigued me. Whilst I was checking Xtrack CAD, I noticed functionality to create custom track sections. So I decided to have a go to see how this would work. Given the tweaks implemented in the Mtrack library there, I had to recreate everything radius 2, apart from two <laughs> standard curves, to match the Merklin data exactly. And I added an additional curved 5208, which I called 5208-C with an angle of 1 degree 1 minute. I have saved all my new items in an additional library that I can load in addition to the original Merklin Amtrak libraries. And here's the result with a few combinations. Everything lines up perfectly, the parallel spacing is correct and doesn't drift. If we expand to a larger layout, we don't get any build-up of gaps or deviations. And this is with tolerances set to a minimum. Very nice! This is no more difficult to use than any other track library, but of course I know what I have done and when to use it split already. A similar editing function used to be available in some commercial packages up until about 5 to 10 years ago. I know Rail Modeler has had plans to reintroduce it for a few years now. This would certainly have helped me in this case. So here is a suggestion that might not pass the math purity test but would be workable in my opinion. I am sure developers all use some form of track editor internally. So how about creating a small library containing two correctly dimensioned crossings and a curved 5208 that people could load if they wanted to? Using Xtrack CAD as a guide, this would take no more than a couple of minutes to set up.
This would have the benefit of not having to change the current software distribution, so everything would carry on working as it does today, and only generate calls when nitpickers like me look a bit closer. In such cases, developers could point people to the additional library and send them a ready-made email template with a few explanations on where to find it and how to load it. This would move the level of the conversation from the current mere clean, blah blah blah, mathematically impossible, blah blah blah, and the ping pong that usually follows to a more positive, yep, we know, but here's a solution type of conversation, and that would be easier on everyone's time and patience. I'd certainly be happy with something like that, and I wouldn't think less of the software. If you are a Extract CAD user and you would like to play with the library I created, please contact me using the channel email address in the description and I'll send you a copy. OK, we've reached the end of yet another long video about nothing much. If you've made it that far, I hope you found it interesting nevertheless. Normal operations should resume in the next video, hopefully. I'd like to thank you very much for watching. This is very much appreciated. I find all the subscriptions, like and shares you have been giving me very rewarding and they keep me going. They are also the best way to increase the visibility of the channel, even with something as simple as a little like. So many thanks again for all this and bye for now.